Welcome everybody to yet another episode of Shitko Talks. Uh, today we are going to get some insights on the topic uh, regarding heart rate variability. And I have brought uh, today one of the leading experts in the field, Marco Altini. I think that most of you know uh, quite well Marco. If that's not the case, Marco is a PhD in de- data science. He also has a master's degree in high-performance sports coaching and in computer science. He's a very proficient uh, researcher in data science, especially related to sports. And many of you will know him because he's the, the founder of HRV for Training, this famous app, which most of you are using to measure your heart rate variability. Many thanks, Marco, for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so... Uh, first of all, I would like to, you know, talk uh, a little bit about HRV, uh, like a short introduction. Could you explain us uh, what is HRV and its, you know, relationship with with uh, the autonomous nervous system? Yeah, for sure. So when we talk about HRV, we are referring to the variability between heartbeats. So as the heart is beating. There's always some differences in time between the time that you have between consecutive beats, right? So your heart is beating, let's say, at 60 beats per minute, and still you don't have a beat exactly every second. There is some variability in the time we can detect heartbeats. And that is something that we can quantify over a period of time let's say a minute at least if we measure our HRV in the morning and you know the protocols may be something we can talk about later but still over a period of time we look at this variability in heartbeats and that is what we call heart rate variability and the reason why we look at that yeah. is as you mentioned it's linked with the autonomic nervous system and in particular the fact that this variability is not random or due to chance, but it's actually linked to how the body responds to stressors. So as we face stress, any form of stress, we have a response of the body in terms of the autonomic nervous system, which typically increases in sympathetic activity, which is what we can call also the fight or flight, or, uh, you know, we need to use resources, and that is typically um associated to an increased heart rate for example something that is obvious if we exercise or do anything with the physical activity involved this response also typically brings a reduction in parasympathetic activity which is the other part of the autonomic nervous system and that is what is normally associated to rest and recovery so as the autonomic nervous system changes its function let's say to cope with the stressors that we are facing, it has an influence on heart rhythm. So basically, as we said, heart rate increases a bit, but also the variability changes. So when heart rate is higher, the variability is lower, so heart rate is a bit more constant. While when we are rested, we are relaxed, and the parasympathetic activity is higher, then typically we have more variability between heartbeats. So since we cannot really measure stress and we cannot measure the autonomic nervous system either, we can look at heart rate variability as a proxy of the stress response because as we face a stressor, the autonomic nervous system will impact heart activity and heart rhythm, and that is something we can measure. So we measure heart rate variability as a marker of the stress response. Okay, Marco, you have talked here about different stressors. Uh, I guess uh, we have many different stressors that, that can impact our uh, heart rate variability. Some of them may be the food you eat or the alcohol you consume or the sleep you get. Could you summarize you know, the main stressors that can impact our HRV specifically specifically when we, we are talking about athletes? Yeah, yeah well, um, I would say the good thing and maybe also the bad thing about heart rate variability is that it is sensitive to many stressors, I would say basically all stressors because it's just the body's stress response that impacts heart rate variability, but it's not specific of anything. So typically, if we have a negative stress response, and maybe that's also something we can we can clarify 
uh, first, just a second, meaning that when we look at HRV and we see, for example, a suppression in HRV that indicates more stress, if we measure according to best practices and good protocols, then what we are capturing there is the stress response. It's not the stressor itself. I think that is why it is useful. So if I experience stress today and tomorrow morning I measure my HRV, I don't expect it to be low because today I did high intensity exercise. If my body has responded well in these hours and also through sleep, then I expect HRV again to be normal tomorrow. So it is not the stressor because we already know the stressor, right? We apply it with training or other things, but it's really the response. And that is why it is interesting. If tomorrow it is suppressed, then maybe today I overdid it a bit. Maybe I was, you know, something uh, doing a workout that is too much for my current fitness level or things like that. So that is something also I think important to, to understand. It's really about the response and it's about cumulative stressors. So I mentioned high intensity training, but as you said, it could be nutrition, it could be sleep, it could be alcohol intake, it could be sickness, it could be travel uh, that could also be common for athletes. I think maybe the relationship with sleep is particularly interesting because it's a bit different with respect to the other stressors, meaning that it goes in both directions, right? So if tonight I am, um, let's say my HRV is, is suppressed, meaning simply that I am particularly stressed or that even just psychologically or mentally due to work or other worries, or maybe even in a positive way, I might be particularly excited. Maybe as an athlete, I had a race or I had a good workout and I did it late in the day, in the evening, or I had a game or something like that. That more excited state, let's call it this way, which is typically associated with slightly increased heart rate and more suppressed HRV, is also able to impact sleep in a way that we might not sleep as well as we would if we were in a more relaxed state, if we were going to bed, for example, with a, let's say, call it a higher HRV. Now, the relationship is also in the other direction, meaning that as we sleep, if we sleep well and recover, then there is also a larger difference in our HRV in the night with respect to the day. So we might have it much higher in the night because, again, we are recovering, we are resting, we are sleeping, we are in a highly parasympathetic state. And then when we wake up in the morning, we might be in a better state also to deal with the stressors of that day. While if our sleep is disrupted or poor or not good, then it will likely impact also for example, the HIV of the morning after, which might be a reflection of our inability to deal with stressors in the same way. So there is a more complex relationship there, of course, as sleep is key uh, process each day of our life. So it's important to try to basically prioritize that in a way that we can get a restorative sleep and possibly also be better prepared to deal with the stressors of the day after. And the HIV also there can be a marker of how this process is going. Um, in terms of the other stressors, typically it's easy to see acute stressors in HIV data, day-to-day changes. For example, again, I'm getting sick or I'm traveling or uh, uh, yes, I mean, any, anything else that is a negative stressor for, for us um, can be seen in the data in the short term. In the longer term, things are a bit more complex, but I think also there can be uh, maybe even a better use. Uh, maybe it's a particularly difficult period in work or other things, right? Not every athlete is professional. They can dedicate themselves fully to the sport. Even professionals, of course, have other stressors that are not just um, sport-related or training-related, or they might be even due to training or to their profession um, outside of the training itself. For example, you know, being busy with contracts or sponsorships or other concerns in terms of, you know, financing your 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 life as a professional athlete and things like that. So all of these things might build up a bit slowly over time in a way that have impact your data a bit more chronically. And so even in that sense, not just the day-to-day acute stressors, but chronically over a longer period of time, we might be able to see how we are responding to certain stressors and hopefully make some adjustments. Which one would be, in your experience, the, the, the factor that impacts HRV the most? Well, acutely, typically, is factors that hopefully are quite rare, like sickness. You would have a much larger impact with respect to even training of high intensity. 
Um, also, I think a lot to do uh, with changes in HIV is the context, right? So if we talk about an athlete, a professional athlete that has a certain uh, periodization in training over the year and typically knows what they are doing, right? So the stimulus is appropriate to the training phase, to the current fitness and things like that. Even when they train really hard, typically we don't expect to see a suppression. So the day after things should go again within the normal range. So only unexpected things tend to um, to show up in the data. For example, again, maybe we travel or we eat a bit differently or some no training related stressors. Uh, or again, sometimes we get sick for one reason or the other. So there's these things tend to be in the data more than the training itself. I think that's why it's also useful because we know a lot about training, especially when you work with professionals. Cool. Um, you might also know a lot about their response if you've been following them for a long time. But there's always different factors and different things that can impact um, our physiology and that having you know a marker of your response that is sensitive to, let's say, overall stress, not just to training. I think it can be um, insightful, even though when things go wrong, you always have to bring up that context to try to understand what is happening and what might be causing this uh, change in the data that you don't expect, because the data alone will not be able to tell you. Okay. Nowadays, most people are measuring HRV with apps, such as the one designed by you, HRV for training. Either, either with a uh, heart rate strap or with the camera on their phone. But I would like to know, uh, you know, the details of the measurement, such as the frequency, the the best duration, and also the conditions, the preferred conditions at which, you know, you, you will have to measure to obtain the best results. Yeah, so the thing about the HRV is that it is something that is linked to the stress response, as we were saying at the beginning. But that is the case only under certain circumstances, right? Because what we see a lot today is also that this relationship is being extrapolated in a way that doesn't always reflect what is really happening in the body or how we know we can use the data. Um, I will try to clarify with some examples. So if we measure HRV according to good protocols, and that would be either first thing in the morning or during the night, then we can capture the stress response. And there are some differences in these two protocols that we can we can discuss briefly later. But still, when we measure in these conditions, typically we measure far from other stressors, far from confounding factors. We can do it in a similar way every day. And that makes the data consistent across days, which allows us to basically capture how the data changes in response to stressors and to capture our stress response. That is not the case if we take measurements at other random times. For example, um, if I'm talking, then this is also disrupting my breathing a bit and it will impact the data in a way that doesn't even reflect stress. And all sort of things will impact the data in ways that doesn't reflect stress. For example, even if I just drink water and this is even a dose response relationship with the more water I drink, the higher will be my HRV in the next hour, hour and a half. But that has nothing to do with my recovery and stress response. That is why I think it's not really possible to use HRV outside of these very controlled settings in a meaningful way. Even in research, when we do studies where we look at HRV, for example, before and after exercise, to look at the impact of exercise of different intensities. Some of the research that was done, um, even side there about maybe 20 years ago, almost, some of the actually most insightful research about HRV and how to use HRV to control training comes from these studies where people measure before training and after training. And something that is so simple is actually almost impossible to do it outside of the lab because there is so many confounding factors that nobody in their life can end the training and then basically not do anything for the next two, three hours because you cannot shower, you cannot eat, you cannot drink. You have to sit, you cannot talk, you cannot move, and then we measure how your HRV changes over this period of time to understand the impact of training. And that is just not possible for practical reasons to do it. And if we still measure, like with wearable devices, then measure all the time, we just collect noise because any sort of thing that we do will disrupt the data in a way that is not representative of our stress 
response. So unfortunately, this link between parasympathetic activity, stress, and HRV holds true only under certain conditions, and it is now being used in all sorts of situations in which it doesn't really hold true. So that is a bit of an issue that we have with technology today. But if we were to really try to use this technology properly in the context of monitoring our stress response or working with other athletes, my recommendation would be either you measure first thing in the morning or you measure in the night if you want to use a device that um, measures as you sleep. The main differences there are that in the night, basically you can measure, you end up measuring a bit closer to the stressors, right? Because the night comes before the morning. So if you exercised in the evening or if you had some alcohol in the evening or if you ate a late dinner, all of these things might show up in the data that might look like there is more stress on the body, even though that stress is basically irrelevant in many situations because you are not looking at the response anymore. You're just looking at data collected too soon after the stressor. And it is perfectly normal that it takes time for the body to renormalize after we have done a number of different things. In the morning, after the restorative effect of sleep, I believe it is a better time. And we can also use a measurement uh, in a different position. For example, you are not constrained to measuring while lying down, which is, of course, what you do when you sleep. If you measure when you sit up, typically you introduce a bit of stress called the orthostatic stressor. Basically, you sit up, your body has to readjust. And that if you measure within a short time frame from sitting up, that allows you to capture a bit better the stress response. Basically, it is amplified, right? If you actually are sick and you can you try to do that, you will see that your heart rate after sitting up is a lot higher than it is when you're lying down. And, you know, that amplification of the stress response is what allows you to also to capture in a more sensitive way how you're responding to training and other more subtle stressors. So I think that is another advantage of doing it first thing in the morning. Obviously, this requires that you do something as opposed to just wearing a device. So that is not always possible. Maybe there are situations in which, uh, from a practical point of view, it's not possible. Maybe you have, um, I don't know, young children or anything that makes your morning routine a lot more hectic, and then it's just not possible to measure that way. So you might want to use a device, assuming you sleep through the night, because if you're also awake during the night to attend the same young children, then that also doesn't work. Right? So... It's, um, I think practical considerations are always important and we need to see what works best for, uh, for our lifestyle, for our routine. But there are some differences that I tried to highlight there. Once we start collecting the data with one of these protocols, I think ideally we want to collect it every day. In the worst case, uh, I would say three, four days um, in literature have been reported as the minimum to get at least an understanding of long-term changes. Um, if you measure in the morning with an app, then you would, again, sit up, take your measurement, even a minute is sufficient, and that's it. Use a device that over time will um, show you what is your normal range, so what is normal day-to-day -day variability for you, because not all changes are meaningful, right? Data will always differ, right? Today, it will not be exactly like yesterday. It might be a bit higher, a bit lower. But many of these changes are actually irrelevant. So we need to understand what is normal for you. And when you're outside of that, then we might want to implement some changes. How many days or measurements do you need to, to get a nice picture of your what is your normal? So I would say normally uh, more than a month. Uh, in my view, two months is a good time frame because you are not changing what is considered normal for you too quickly, right? Because if we think about, okay, let's just use a few weeks to be in this normal range. But then if you're sick, for example, and it's unfortunately something bad and you are sick for, I don't know, 10 days or something like that, that deviation will basically make your normal being the situation in which you're sick because you've used just too little data to create your normal range, even if you keep updating all the time. So a longer time frame avoids that when you have these acute changes that are a bit longer, they impact too much your data. So I think a longer time frame is good. At the same time, we cannot use it too long. We don't want to use, I don't know, six months or something like that because 
still there's a lot of variation in physiology, even just when it's a different season, right? If it's winter, it is summer, our data is different, so we don't want to get stuck with data that is so old. But, you know, 45, 60 days, I think it's good. In research, often they use just 30 days. I think that's also a bit for practical reasons, right? Sometimes you need people to take their measurements, to enroll in a study, to do a study that is already 8, 12 weeks, and you want to start maybe a month earlier, two months earlier. So there's always practical considerations in your research. And that is why I think often a month is used, which is what I would consider at this point the, the minimum to, to do this. Okay. I think that here we have some nice insights to, to perform our measurements. One of the most interesting uh, concepts that derives from the HRV measurements is the training readiness. Uh, this will inform us uh, as to when do you need to push even harder in your training or uh, back off a little bit. At which metrics would you look at before deciding one way or the other? All right, so when it comes to using metrics from wearables or HRV measurements and things like that, in terms of adjusting training, I think the key word there is really adjusting. So meaning that we need to start with a plan, right? And there is, it might sound obvious, you know, to you and maybe an audience that is into training, but many people approach this technology and they expect it basically to provide guidance even without a plan, meaning that it will tell you every day if you need to go hard, if you need to go easy, and things like that. But the body doesn't work like that. So what we can see is how the body has responded to the stimulus. But if, again, we have responded well and everything is normal, even after a high-intensity session yesterday, that doesn't mean that we should go hard every single day until it's not normal anymore, right? So... It's important to start with a plan where we will have, you know, our hard days, our easy days, the structure that is best you know, for us based on what we have um, yeah, planned. And then we can make small adjustments based on physiological data. In particular, I think what is useful is your physiological response in terms of HRV and, of course, your subjective feel and a series of subjective parameters that you can easily track, like how sore you are, something you cannot measure with any device, right? And at the same time, also your motivation to train that you also cannot measure, like all sort of things that only you know. And, you know, despite the fact that, again, wearables and devices are marketed to you as the ones that will make this decision for you, what is your readiness, what is your recovery, but that is not really possible to do. And again, to me, soreness is the best example, right? As endurance athletes, typically, when we train hard, then for a day or a couple of days, we just can't do that again. And we might be perfectly fine. Our physiology is perfectly fine. Our heart rate is normal. Our HRV is normal. Everything is good. But the muscles just can't do it. And that it cannot be measured by any wearable device. So if a device claims to have this holistic overview of your state so that it can give you a readiness or recovery score, but then fails to capture something that is so important in the context of having recovered from the previous session, then it's just not something that we can trust. So on my end, I try to do it a bit differently. We only report the physiology. If the physiology is within normal, then everything is okay. And the advice is not to go hard. It's just to proceed as planned, which assumes you do have a plan. So if today I went hard and tomorrow my physiology is normal, great, it means I responded well. And then my plan for tomorrow is anyway to do something easy and I will do something easy. So that is a bit how I think about the data and the subjective data also obviously plays an important role. There can be situations in which maybe that becomes more important and there can be situations in which maybe the physiology is also something that gives us some useful insights. Maybe we don't feel so great, or maybe we feel okay, but the result is suppressed for a day or two. It might be picking up that we are getting sick or something is off, so it could be a good idea to make a small exhaust. So that's a bit the framework in which I would think. And then in, in the way we actually use the data comes back again to the paper that Steven Seiler wrote, um, looking at the intensity of the stimulus and its effect on autonomic activity. Again, this was done by measuring before and after exercise at different time frames. 
And you could see that for training of a certain duration, even when the duration was doubled, if the intensity is low, and low we can we can say something below the first ventilatory threshold, for example, the first day threshold, so what we call, you know, zone one, two in five zones. Easy training. If your training is easy, even higher volume training typically does not impact your autonomic nervous system much, meaning that you will bounce back to normal rather quickly after exercise. But if the intensity of the stimulus is high, so moderate intensity between thresholds or high intensity even above the second threshold, then in these cases, we have that autonomic nervous system is disrupted for much longer. So it takes a long time for HIV to renormalize. And interestingly, uh, side of split, also the results based on fitness level of the athlete. So you could also see that the fitter you are, the quicker you bounce back to your normal. And that speaks also to what we were saying before, more anecdotally about elite athletes having their data almost always within their normal. Even if they do train very hard, it's just that they recover also very quickly. So the idea behind adjusting training, given this data, is typically to adjust the intensity more than the duration. So if it shall be suppressed, we are already in a state that maybe is not ideal. There's already a negative response to stress and we might still train, but then we scale down the intensity. So if we had a hard session, maybe we postpone that for a moment in which we might be able to absorb the stimulus better as opposed to still doing the hard training with uh, with suppressed um, HRV and being in a negative state. While for the volume, typically, that could stay or even be longer and it should not impact it as much, again, depending on our fitness. Yeah, one of the main setbacks associated with uh, HRV measurements for me is the, as, as with many other uh, numerical data that can be incorporated into athletes' training, is the fact that uh, once you measure and you get a number, there is a risk of bias for the athlete in 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 a way in which when you are going to train today and you get a numerical number that shows you that your values today are below what they should be or above what they should be, you 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 can get biased in a, in a way in which you you try to train and you start uh, fin- saying to yourself, okay, today is not my day, etc. And I have seen this many times with athletes. And uh, I would like to get insight from you regarding this uh, because I, I have always thought that it would be a good idea to blind the the result from the athlete. I, I don't know what you think about this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's a, that's a factor to consider, meaning that uh, it's obviously there. Uh, one thing to remember that I think might be helpful also for the athlete or the person that is just maybe using the data or is self-coached and, and therefore they are looking there at their data is that HRV doesn't determine what you can do. So it's more about how you will respond to the stimulus than about what you can do today. So if you're HRV suppressed, we exclude, of course, a situation in which you're sick and obviously something is wrong and you might not perform well. But let's say it's suppressed for any other reason, some stress or whatever, then you can still perform at your best, right? It's not really an issue with the performance of that day. That's why we shouldn't get stressed if it is low or race day. Actually, in these situations, it might be even normal for it to be suppressed because maybe you're just a bit excited about the event or a bit more nervous and, and that is, is, is not a problem. But where it comes in, I think it's really in the uh, ability of the body done to respond positively to this stimulus. And that is why it can be useful in training, I think, to make adjustments. But then it's not necessarily particularly relevant, you know, if we are racing or or the day of the event or things like that. So if you are concerned that psychologically could bother you in those situations, I think it's okay not to measure or just to keep it blinded if you want to have a look later. There's in the tools, typically you can do that in a way you don't look at the data today and then uh, after the fact, you might still be curious to have a look, but it doesn't really matter because anyway, you're right? Well, during training, you might want to provide the stimulus at the best time, right? We all understand that 
not only the stimulus, but also the timing of the stimulus matters. And this could guide a bit HMB um, in terms of how you provide the stimulus. So in that case, it could be useful to look at the data daily. But again, we need, I think, to understand that it's just a marker of your stress response that on most days, it should actually just be normal. So I think here, an issue could also be with some of the tools that try to maybe engage too much the user, right? There's numbers from zero to 100 or, or you know, percentages, and they tend to uh, stress the fact that higher is better and, and things like that, while I think the conversation should shift a bit towards, you know, is this normal or it's maybe abnormal, meaning there is an important suppression and that is rare. So on most days, it shouldn't be really boring. Like you take your measurement, you look at the data, it's normal again, like just every other day. So I think a bit of the issue is maybe how the tool presents the information. And uh, of course, there is also a fact that numbers and advice and, and colors might impact us um, and, and impact the way we approach our training and things that we are doing. So that is um, to think about, I think that in general, a layer of education can always help, right? So if the athletes know these things that we talk about today, I think they also understand better that there is, you know, nothing deterministic about it. It doesn't decide what you can do, what you cannot do. There's just a way to track your stress response. And maybe today is low and you ignore it and you do your heart session and tomorrow it is perfectly normal. And that is okay. It's like, it, it doesn't mean anything in a way, right? So that is why also research has shifted a bit from focusing a lot on the daily value before it was like this, even the HRV guided trainings, based on the value of today, we decide what to do, if we make an adjustment or not. While now we look at the baseline, we call it, it's just a seven day moving average with respect to your normal range. So by definition, since it's a seven day moving average, it takes more time for it to go outside of your norm. So if today is suppressed, tomorrow is suppressed, a third day is suppressed, then the, the moving average starts to go low, 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 and then it might make sense to make a change because there is clearly a stronger stressor and we are not anymore overly reactive on what happens every single day. I think, you know, the truth is in between, right? Because if you are sick, then you don't want to wait for days to make an adjustment. So research studies and real life need to meet somewhere. Um, we need to look a bit at, at both these things um, and, and build a bit of nuance. And then I think the tool can become useful. Yeah, one of the other um, issues I have found frequently with athletes is that they doubt the reliability of the of the of the app or whatever whichever method they are using. And you will encounter the typical athlete that you know, sits on the sofa and measures four times in a row and he tells you, I got a different result each time I measured. What 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 would you tell him in these cases? Yeah, yeah. I think this happens. Uh, part of it is normal, meaning that even if I just wear a chest strap and I measure while sitting there for a long period of time and then I look at all my HRV changes, it's not always the same value. Like, there, is, there is variability. It is partially due to breathing. It's partially due to whatever is going on in our head. Um, the, given this context, this is why the normal range is important, right? So on, after many days, then depending on the day-to-day -day variability, this range can be wider or smaller for an individual based on how, let's say, variable is their data, right? So the more jumping around, the, the wider also the range so that Basically, you can uh, be outside of this range only on situations in which the variation is still even higher. Then I think part of the repeatability issue typically is simple artifacts as well. So things that we need to know that we shouldn't do and typically we don't think about it or, or we don't know. For example, even if I just swallow saliva, which is something that we do a million times in a day, that we can change your HRP by a factor of two. So it will be twice as high if you do that in a minute while you're measuring. So once you know that, then of course you make a conscious effort not to do it. Otherwise, it is perfectly normal that in a few measurements you will do it in some and not in others. Other small things, I don't know, yawning, <laughs> things like that will, will all impact the data. And obviously these things are not impacting your stress. 
are just impacting the bit to bit uh, variability. And therefore, the impact of stress is confounded by all these other things. So I think, you know, try to just relax, sit there, take your measurement, try not to do other things. Once you've taken your measurement, that's it. Sometimes if you go back and measure again, then even mentally you can influence it because you might get frustrated or you might start, you know, getting in this line of thinking. And that is also not helpful because, of course, that is a stressor and that will impact the rate as well. So we try to keep it really simple. Just keep measuring every day, simple protocol in the same way. Try not to swallow, to yawn. Um, you can make it two minute long, a bit more time reduces this repeated measures variability, right? Because it's a bit more data. And also your breathing, that is important. Try to keep it, you know, relaxed. Do not force it particularly up for some measurement and not for others. Uh, yeah, it sounds complex, but once you start doing it every day, I think it's pretty simple. What, what is, in your opinion, the most common mistake that athletes do when attempting to, to recover their HRV data? And what will be a single piece of advice to, you know, address this, this mistake? So I think um, maybe in terms of using the data, it would be a bit rhetoric about having higher values or um, aiming even for higher values, especially for, uh, for athletes that typically already exercise a fair amount and might have a, a good lifestyle in terms of, you know, eating well and trying to prioritize sleep and other things. I think the data is more useful if we think about stability in the data. So over time, having, you know, responses that are quick, that you get back to normal after a stressor and things are quite stable within your normal range on most occasions, more than trying to optimize it or increase it or, or change it in a way which is a bit, you know, the, the common rhetoric about the should be, should be higher than this and that. I think that was questionable in general because there is a strong genetic component, but especially in this context of, you know, healthy, active individuals, I think it's, it's very unlikely that when you start measuring, there will be changes that lead to different uh, absolute values. And on the other hand, again, there are seasonal changes and all sorts of things that can actually change your normal range, even in the opposite direction. And that is okay. But keeping, you know, your day-to-day -day data and weekly data within your normal range typically means that you're responding well to stressors. So I would try, uh, yeah, to look at the data that way uh, over time and understand the limitations that we discussed so far. And that should make it useful. In the end, it's the same piece of advice that you could give someone in other aspects of training, because in the end, you are looking for increasing adherence and this routine that, you know, allows you to, to not get injured, not to get sick. And in the end, you will, you will, you'll have more training days behind your back. No, it's the same, the yeah, same yeah, story. Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes people get really into the metric as the thing to optimize, but we need to remember that, you know, Health and performance is our outcome, and it's just a tool. Yeah. Okay, Marco. So I think that uh, we got uh, several very nice insights regarding HRV for training, and many people who are either either initiating or you know have been doing this for years. I think that may change some some of their perspectives after this podcast. Many thanks again for for accepting the invitation, and hope you see you soon again here to discuss uh, a little bit uh, in more advanced this HRV topic. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.